Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, MBE, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. Good luck. Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been having a great week and I hope you've been out there pursuing your physical best performance. Every now and then something really special happens and today's guest and today's episode is one of those occurrences, certainly in my life. I had the absolute pleasure of catching up with today's guest, Phil Liggett, recently to record an episode of the Physical Performance Show. Phil Liggett, MBE, member of the Order of the British Empire, needs very little introduction. He is the voice of cycling. Now this is the battle for who takes the yellow home after Sunday as we come into this beautiful town or in the Wazon area of France. Domestically here in Australia, we best know him for his coverage of the Tour de France, his commentary from 1991 right through until 2016. Internationally, Phil Liggett has reported on 15 Olympic Games and 44 Tour de France races. In addition to Phil's prolific media career, Phil has also authored four books and himself was also once a professional cyclist who gave up a somewhat promising career racing the great Eddie Merckx to pursue a career in the media. And what a great decision that turned out to be. Listeners, in today's episode, we cover all manners of things, all things cycling. We talk about the heroes of the sport. We play a fun game of name association. We talk about Phil's entry into the media in his early cycling career. We talk about highlights and lowlights of the Tour de France, Phil's love affair with South Africa. We even get to meet Phil's beautiful wife through this interview. And of course, as everyone's wondering and interested about, we also touch on Lance Armstrong and his fall from grace. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusions to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. And listeners, bear with me as I self-indulge on a childhood bucket list item as Phil humors me, not once but twice in this episode of the Physical Performance Show. So we're going to simply jump right in with Phil Liggett, MBE, the voice of cycling. Phil Liggett, this is an absolute pleasure and honour. And uh, as a fan of cycling triathlon, I listened to your voice through the 90s growing up and I would go out and ride part of the Grafton Gin Varel course and have your voice in my ears pretty much the whole time, uh, pretending mock commentary that I was breaking away on a stage win. Phil, uh, <laughs> can I get you to do something a little bit out of the box for a bit of fun at the start of the show? Would you mind giving me a little bit of a mock commentary call as the uh, the young boy from Grafton, Brad Beer, winning a stage of the tour? <laughs> well, why not, Brad? I mean, I my history of Grafton is I was there when the Commonwealth Bank Cycling Classic used to pass through Grafton. And for me, everything was brand new in Australia at that time. And, of course, it's famous for its jacaranda trees and uh and I'll always remember that. So let's just think now. Well, we're looking down the straight here at the moment at Inverell. It's been a long day out for the riders. But there is one man just in front. He's hanging on in there. His name is Brad Beer. And I'll tell you what, if he wins this, it'll be a big surprise. He didn't start as a favourite, but it looks like he might hold on here. He's up amongst the crowd line. He's hanging on to the barriers. The bunch can't see him. He's at 200 metres to go. He's not going to be caught now. Brad Beer has just set the best victory of his career. Well done. Oh, Phil, you have just made a, uh, a young boy's dream come true <laughs> without the need for the exertion of a pro career. So thank you very much for humouring me, Phil Liggett. 
<laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Phil, something a bit funny and uh, a little bit quirky. What's one thing that scares Phil Liggett? Oh, dear. Probably the wife, but I'll, I'll stop there because you can hear this conversation. Trish is at home at the moment. Was that Trish in the background? <laughs> It was, and she said she's making a scarecrow because we're going to Africa next week for two months, and I'm trying to stop the heron eating all my fish. So we've just been sawing wood. We're now stuffing it with my best trousers, and hopefully it'll frighten the buggers off. Uh, that's an that's a side, though, isn't it? Yeah. No, well, look, Phil, uh, Trish and yourself, I believe you've enjoyed 45 years of marriage. What, what's the, the secret to longevity, Phil, in the marriage stakes? Travel a lot and never see the wife. It's easy. Um, <laughs> Actually, we're 47 years next March. Oh, my and correction. We oh, together my because we met, um, we met in 69, 68, 69. I broke my collarbone. I hit the back of a police car while I was training. His fault, I hasten to add. And that's the only injury I've had in cycling, uh, actually. And I broke my right collarbone. Uh, I won a race 10 days after that, too, uh, which was rather surprising. But the, uh, I met Trish because she joined my cycling club just after the 68 Olympic Games. She was in the Winter Olympics as a skater, speed skater. And so she was cycling to stay fit, to continue her sport. And, um, and I met her at the club and she would kindly drove me to the cycling club when I had a broken collarbone, couldn't drive for two weeks. And that's how we met. And uh, the rest is history, as they always say. And we've... Uh, we have done a lot together because she was my secretary when I organised the Tour of Britain milk race for 22 years. That was a 12-day race uh, at the time. And then um, uh, she went on as, she, uh, contrary to what everybody thinks, she was the very first female masseuse to work on a professional team, which she did. Uh, although they always credit my old friend Shelley Versus because she was the first top-line pro tour masseuse. Um, yeah, and so we've run in Palo, but she's done five tours uh, on the women's sector. And when she was on the Tour de France, uh, uh, they're, only, they're always working sort of ahead of us because they're on the same course. Never actually saw her till the finish, but that was three weeks within within about two hours drive every day of each other. But we never actually got it together because I was working, rushing to the finish for live TV, etc. And so we've done pretty much a similar lifestyle. She worked on body and fitness and all that ever since we met, really. Yeah. Well, and so uh, what was uh, Trisha's highlight at the Olympic Games, uh, ice skating there? Probably getting there, I would imagine, because that was a surprise in itself. She, yeah. uh, her brother was very good, uh, but he didn't like being away from home. So Trish went around as his manager, skating with him, but as his manager. And she qualified for the Games in the women's department. So they became the first ever brother and sister duo to take part in a Winter Olympic Games. Uh, so they've they've lived on that ever since. They both held all the British records, and uh, and John's still a, a very fit guy. Uh, he rides a lot of motorbikes. He doesn't ride much bike. Yeah. Well, well that's outstanding. And, and uh, Phil, you mentioned at the start you're getting ready to head off to South Africa. I mean, listeners and yeah. people that are familiar with you know with you as the voice of cycling may not know that, but you do have an affinity for South Africa. I believe you've got a game farm. Is that correct? Somewhere uh, near the Kruger National Park. It is correct. I mean, when I first discovered Australia, thanks to Phil Bates out of Sydney, who organised the Commonwealth Bank Cycling Classic, he brought an Australian team to my milk race in the May of 88. And he said, mate, you've got to come and see my race. It's called the Commonwealth Bank's Classic. I'll send you a couple of tickets. And that's what happened. He did. And I went out in after the Seoul Olympic Games. I went on to Australia. And, I, uh, and when I discovered Australia, I, I was totally amazed with the country. Never been remotely close to Australia. Seeing cockatoos and koalas and kangaroos to anybody that doesn't live there is quite an amazing sight. And so I fell in love with Australia. And over the years, I've seen most of it. Uh, and then we transferred from my interest there in 1989-90. Uh, apartheid was about to come to an end, but at the time it was in full swing and the African TV had a big race in Cape Town called the, at the time, it was called the Argus Cycle Tour, Argus being the local newspaper. And they were getting 12,000 riders. Well, now, of course, they get 40,000 riders, and I'm still going to the event and have been ever since 1990. But at the time they asked me, they offered me a lot of money. They wrote and said, I understand you, son, you understand something about cycling. We need a good commentator. That's how I 
I came to be approached, but I couldn't go because all sports men and any sports attachments were banned and black forever because of apartheid. You could not work in South Africa. But the following year, it was breaking up, so I was able to accept, and I've been going ever since. And again, when I stepped off the aeroplane in Cape Town, I saw the Table Mountain, I saw the lovely weather, the, the gracious people that live there, and it became my favorite city. It overtook Sydney, can you believe? And uh, it became my favorite city. And so I did a lot of work in Africa and I still do. I'm very involved now. I bought an apartment with Trish in Gordons Bay, which is on the outskirts of Cape Town, on an area known as False Bay, because it was where all the mariners went in and sank the ships, thinking they were heading for Cape Town and they were in a box canyon. And down they went. Uh, but it's also the breeding ground for the southern right whale. And it's 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 a, it's a lovely place, and and I'm patron now of BirdLife South Africa because I'm a big bird watcher, and also I do a lot of work by the way with BirdLife Australia. I do talks for them and all sorts. They're good mates down in Melbourne, and then I just sort of decided to go for a piece of land up in the north, which is the tropical end of South Africa. They have two seasons, wet and dry, hot and cold, and they uh, I bought a piece of land. And then I didn't realize what I was buying into it was not a holiday home, but a poacher's paradise. And then I got involved with saving the rhino from extinction in the wild. And we all we all handle that. Trish is on the board of trustees for helpingrhinos.org. I'm the patron and uh, cycling over the years since. Uh, and it was also all started by Orica Greenedge, as they were called then, with Jerry Ryan, yes. who gave me uh, $30,000. Uh, to start it going, and so and the cyclists since then. This year we've we've uh, uh, collected just over half a million dollars. It's our best year so far, which all goes back to Africa, not just South Africa, goes to Kenya and places like that, and um, and Uganda, and it, and cycling is responsible for half of that half a million dollars each year, which is terrific. So, yeah, so that, they're my hobbies, I suppose you can call them. If listeners would like to donate to that great cause, uh, where can listeners go? Uh, is there a website to make donations? Yeah, the website is www.helpingrhinos.org, O-R-G. And it's all on there. The whole history is on there. Um, we have lots of sportives around Britain now where the guys come and ride in our jersey and something and buy a jersey they can donate to the rhinos we're working very closely with south australia and adelaide zoos because we're bringing rhinos to south australia to breed and take back into africa and release um it's all long-term projects you know and um, everybody i talk to uh, and i think basically cyclists love the open air they love what they see they don't want to ri- ride around an industrial estate for the rest of their days they appreciate the wildlife uh, and that's why they've been so co- so kind to us, and um, and uh, we're delighted. Tremendous. And and Phil, going from the rhinos to an elephant. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe previous to your game farm uh, hobby taking a big part of your life, uh, you yeah. did hit a a uh, elephant riding on your bike. Can you put listeners uh, in the, the picture of this story? Well, that was not far off 100 years ago. I was at my first job. I wanted to be um, a zoologist, really, and I took a job as a zookeeper straight out of school. I was about 18, and I was also starting my cycling life, if you like. I didn't start racing until I was 17. And so I was riding to work because I lived on the Wirral, which is a little peninsula uh, up on the Wirral Peninsula in Cheshire, which separates Chester and Manchester and Liverpool. And... I used to ride to Chester on my bike, which was about 20K each day. And I didn't know at the time, being a new boy, that they, when the, the zoos aren't open to the public, they very often let the animals loose uh, to enjoy the gardens. And in the case of the elephants, they're fantastic at weeding in the garden because one sweep of the trunk and all the, all the nettles are gone. And, of course, they were around the back of the tea hut when I went for my tea break and I rode straight into the back of an elephant, which was round the back with the keeper, looking after the weeds. And, uh, I, yeah, I bent my bike and buggered it. So I was very <laughs> happy about that. It broke my heart. But that was an Indian elephant, which are much more friendlier than, and tameable, whereas the African elephant certainly is not. Now I've got them looking in the windows and they walk all around our house and Trish is very good at speaking to them. She really is an elephant whisperer. Wow. Literally around your windows there in the game park in South Africa are elephants. 
It's unbelievable. We've had, we've had people come out of our spare bedroom on their hands and knees into our bedroom saying, look, we're not frightened, but you've got to come and see this. And there you see an elephant with his trunk running around the window. Yeah. Oh, how extraordinary. Phil, uh, your commentary career, obviously we're going to pull that apart, but let's touch on your cycling career. Well before Phil Liggett became the voice of cycling, I believe you, you were issued a pro contract, a bike, a jersey uh, in writing in Belgium. And off the back of that, you know, your media career followed. Take us through, put us in the, your uh, your cleats, if you like, your Nixon cleats of young Phil Liggett yeah. in your riding days. Well, well it's quite a, I have quite a simple life. I made only one decision in my life, and I always say this, and I'd never made another decision. I didn't even make the decision to get married. Trish did. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, she rang me up and told me the date and time and place, and that was the end of that one. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to be a cyclist and... I, was, I couldn't do anything. I'm totally uncoordinated at any ball game. I'm useless. I can't climb. I've got no power on the upper body and all that rubbish. So I started to, I saw a bike and my mate, who was my best friend, said, look, get your bike. We can ride to Wales because Wales was only 20k away. I'd never been there. and We had no car. So I went with him and I went on the long rides over the Welsh mountains with the clubs I met. And then I, within six months, I developed an ambition to be a professional cyclist. I used to see these guys training, and I wanted to be one of them. At that time, of course, there were no professionals in Britain. They were called independents. They were just raced with advertising on. And I couldn't race against the independents until I got my first category license, which I got when I was 19. And then so I was able to now ride against the best riders and total notch up. So then I became, at that time, I'd been asked to start a job as an assistant to the accountant. So that was good. It helped me qualify as an accountant. And um, the accountant said to me one day, he said, look, we'll keep your job for a year because you're not very happy, are you, until you till you try to be a bike rider. I said, no, I really want to go. So he said, okay. So I went to Belgium for uh, for the in, the in 66, the year that Tom Simpson was was champion of the world. And, uh, and I was crazy about him. And then in uh, the winter of 60, uh, joined 66, I, my very first bike race in Belgium, uh, I was really excited. There's over 200 riders in the field because in the amateurs in Belgium, they're crazy. And they're always horrible courses of cobblestones and typical Belgium. It always rains anyway. And I, um, I arrived at the start. Guy took me, who was a pro, took me to the start, British guy. And uh, didn't give me any advice. I just got on the race, and I couldn't believe it. I was right at the front. There was no problems. Pace was okay. Three laps, and then gradually, lap by lap, these guys went faster and faster. And all in a, I, and when I finished, I, I, I didn't finish. I, I got dropped. I said to this guy I was with, I said, I cannot believe a bunch of two hundred riders just rolled me off the back. <laughs> he said, Well, the thing is, they don't start quick. Uh, they just build up and go, and then I couldn't grab a wheel as the line went past me after about two hours of racing. Uh, the next time I rode, I was I was a bit wiser. I finished ninth, uh, but I remember that lesson. I had to learn it very quickly. Anyway, by the end of the year, some Belgian cyclists had noticed me, come across to me, asked me to join and race on their team, and, and then I was offered a chance of being a, over. In those days, it was a bike and a jersey, and we'll put you in races. That was all it was, and you had to earn your earn your stripes after that. So I went home to really get ready. I took a part-time job lifting milk churns and uh, strengthening my back, and it was really quite hard work. And during that period of time, I'd be all year I'd been writing uh, for a magazine in England, in Fleet Street, uh, talking about these bike riders that you forget and never report. And they said, well, we got no money. You write it, and, and we'll do it for you. And I was reporting Simpsons rides. I was doing all our amateur rides, this little group of English people trying to make the grade with a few Americans and people like that. And then during that winter, there was a vacancy appeared and they said, do you want it? I said, crisis, I'm, I'm going back to be a pro. They said, well, you've got, you've got till Monday morning. If you're in the office on Monday morning at eight o'clock sharp, you've got the job. Wow. And so I went home on the Friday and said to mum and dad, I'm going to London. Well, that's like saying you're going to the moon and Northerner never goes to London. <laughs> Only 300k away, but nobody, my mum and dad never went to London and uh, nobody goes to London. You don't want to go down there. You don't want to be with those people. And um, I said, don't worry, I'll be back in a week. 
And of course, I've been down there since 67 and never been back. Wow. And and was that really the, the transition uh, out of your cycling ambition over to what has become your... The decision was uh, to take the job and not turn pro. Wow. And the reason was I raced at the time against Eddie Merckx, who was still an amateur. Yes. And uh, Eddie never lost a race. And not not I rode in anyway. And I never knew Eddie from Adam. But of course, in, as I became a TV commentator and journalist, I interviewed Eddie in his home and we were now very good friends. And I said, you know, Eddie, you're the one guy that stopped me turning pro. Oh, why? Because you were too good. Yes, I was. But then the people expected me to win. And that's what we often laugh and joke now. But uh, yeah, that was the reason he, he was just too good. And I was never going to make a living like like he was obviously going to do. And obviously, Eddie Merckx went on to, uh, as we know, go, go down as one of the all-time greats, you know, uh, world champ at 18, five tours. Exactly. And he, he seven times uh, Milan San Remo, five times Liege, based on Liege. He's just, he's a phenomenon. And uh, and I, I said, Eddie, why didn't you lose a couple of bloody races? Because my newspaper, which I was then working for the Daily Telegraph in London, uh, if I say you've won, they're just not interested in reporting it because they want to know some other story. He says, I'm sorry, but uh, the people come to watch me win, so I must win her. And that's what he did. Uh, he's a great guy. Eddie and I, he's, and he really likes Trish. Um, he's just a lovely guy. What a talent. Oh, I always complain. Oh, I can tell you, I, I, he, some years ago now, and he's, he would be in his 60s at the time, he, um, he came over to this August cycle tour in Cape Town. And I saw, he'd been brought over by some rich friend who brought him over, and he's going to ride. And I met him at a function. I said, and we had a long chat, and he'd put on some weight. Boy, he'd exploded like a balloon. And I, and he said, uh, I said, are you riding any? He says, yeah. I said, boy, looking at him, I said, well, I'm riding too. Uh, I bet you 50 rand, which is bugger all, really, is 16 rand to the pound, about 10 to the dollar. So call it $5. I said, um, I said, I bet you I beat you. You beat me. As he looked at my feet and worked slowly up to my face, thinking there's no chance. And uh, anyway, I never saw him ride. He was in a different group to me. He was in a posh group, celebrity group. And so I uh, didn't see him. And I got the paper in the week, which prints all the results, everybody's time. And I've beaten him. I bloody hell, he owes me 50 rand. <laughs> so for two years after that, I, I never saw Eddie, except I kept sending him messages. Whenever I saw somebody. And when I was back in Africa, I met this uh, Johannesburg journalist. And he said, I can't wait for lunchtime tomorrow. I'm, I'm entertaining Eddie Merckx, writing a story on him. I said, that's brilliant. I said, tell him he owes 50 rand. <laughs> and a week later, I saw this guy. His name was Vainont de Villiers. And I saw Vainont. And he, uh, he said, oh, I've got 50 rand for you. Uh -huh. I said, oh, have you? He said, yeah, so just turn your camera, around, camera back on, Brett, and I'll show you a picture of it, but I've still got it. Okay, can you see it? So in this little folder, from the day he gave it to me, sent it to me, is 50 South African rand, <laughs> worth a lot those days. But when I turned it over, I don't think you can see it, but up here, yep. it says double or quits, Eddie. There's no way that I would say to Eddie double or quits because that guy was no longer fat and he'd have killed me. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And aside from a man of his word, Phil, clearly he yeah. is, that doesn't forget, and that's character, right? What would be the one attribute that uh, you think set Eddie Merckx the great apart from his contemporaries, including yourself, who, who bowed out well, of the race before you got a chance? I must have interviewed probably all of the cyclists since – since the 70s, right through to the current day, all the best riders I've spoken to at some stage. And Eddie is the one who is so confident in his own ability, but he believes in entertaining. And, I mean, Eddie was the most miserable sod to talk to because he always had a problem. And to this day, he always has a problem because, well, I know his son, Axel, a oh, great name for a cyclist, yeah. And Axel Merckx lives in Canada. And Eddie used to always complain, oh, my son, he, bought, he marries a Canadian girl. And now I have to go to Canada every day to see him. I said, Eddie, stop moaning. Because then you go up and say, how are you riding? Oh, not well, huh? You don't hear. Don't hear what? I fell off. I shoot, eh? You crashed, yeah? 
Oh, what happened? Oh, it's, it's bad. Eh? Rib, ribbages are gone and my arm was broken. When was this? Oh, three months ago. Eh? Are you still bad? Yes, it's not so good. Next thing is he's riding these bloody rides and he's off the front. He, he's just a different guy. And he's the only guy to this day uh, who would be a winner before he started because he broke the spirit of most of the bike riders alongside him. He was just too good. To win by 10 minutes wearing the yellow jersey on the stage of the Tour de France is special. Never be done again. And Eddie used to uh, invite riders to attack with him because uh, I know that for a fact. I used to interview somebody like Gerard Kuhl, who was a great rider, a six-day rider, basically, but he rode some good classic races. I interviewed Gerard at the start of the Amstel Gold Race in the 70s. Uh, and I said, uh, Gerard, who, who's fancy? who do you fancy today? He said, huh? He said, if Eddie wants to win, then we all race for second. And no pros ever said that since. Wow. Now, Eddie wow. was special and, and a, a really good guy. A really, I've got to know him completely since he stopped cycling because as a racing cyclist, we, we either clashed or I, I just did him on telly. Yeah. And, and, and Phil, going from, you know, your career, your interception uh, with Eddie Merckx, the great, over to the tour. I mean, I'm leaving out chapters of your career, 20 years, as you said, the milk race director. There's so much yeah. you've done. But obviously here in Australia, you know, worldwide, your voice on the Tour de France is what you are arguably most, you know, known and loved for. Phil, what yeah. is it about? Let's, ask, let's just dive into the tour. Uh, what is it about the tour that you think captures the imagination of so many people, cyclists and non-cyclists alike? It's because of its history. And it's romantic history, which has been, it, there's been some great writers, particularly French writers, who've romanticized the Tour de France. For us, it was, we were inquisitive back home in Britain, and the same in Australia, you know, the first two Aussies, Bill Burl and uh, Chalky, can't remember second name, the wrong. those guys were just, they rode, they, they trained by going to the first Tour de France by riding around the decks of the, of the ship as, it, as they floated across to France, and, and they got around the tour. Uh, th those guys were just very special people, great pioneers. But for the people that knew the Tour de France, and it was a, a, a feat, an extreme feat of strength and courage, especially when they introduced in 1910 the Pyrenees and then 1911 the Alps, because until then they just climbed the Ballon d'Alsace in the in the uh, Vosges, and so. Uh, once they, on those days in the mountains, the high mountains, the riders said, you just, you're just killers, you're all assassins, you know. Uh, and they really battled them. The, the monks uh, live up the mountains and never seen the valleys below. They make their own beer and wine, as monks always did, and they used to pass it up as the riders went over the mountains, <laughs> keep them warm or uh, help them along, you know. I suppose these days it'd be called doping, but uh, in those days it's get there as best you can, mate. And, of course, after the... First year was a big success, but the second year they were going to scrap the tour completely because everybody started cheating. And Maurice Garin won the first tour, was disqualified from the second tour, and in the end it was Henri Cornet who became the youngest winner in the history of the Tour de France. And he didn't even know he'd won until November when they decided to do all these guys who'd taken train rides and got round the course and got out and carried on cycling, you know. Um, so there's always been cheats, to who, and, but they've never prospered, I don't think, in the Tour de France. And it, but it, it happens, you know, everybody. And for the English speakers, of course, then we're, we're only talking of a modern idiom. And well, I like to think it's because I spread the word a lot on television myself. Uh, when I got on TV in 78, we were doing 20 minutes every weekend in Britain on the TV. Then in the early 80s, Channel 4 became on stream. And that and the... the a sports producer there was a friend of mine. We worked together at the Olympic Games. He won Olympic medals before he was a commentator. His name was Adrian Metcalf. And Metas, as we called him, said, hey, I love your sport. I'm going to put it live on the TV every day. I said, what? Yeah. Uh, and then he paid me £200 a year to parry all the letters he got. He said, I only want to read the ones you think have got any chance at all of going anywhere. Just get rid of the rest. And he gave me £200 a year to do that. And so life had started, and then gradually we built the tour up, its image. The Tour de France, I don't think, they knew if it was going to progress into the modern world, it had to get more money, and it wasn't going to come from the traditional sponsors, because they had no money. Perrier, £25,000 a year was nothing. Hang on, we've got, you've got to look at the scarecrow. Uh, hello, Trish. This is a scarecrow. Listen, this, this is a treat. Hello, Trish. <laughs> Oh, it will be. It will be a scarecrow when I dress him and make him a bit fatter. Well, he's a little lean at the moment. Yeah. 
Well, he needs a head as well. He needs some pasta. And he needs a name. Would you like to name him? Oh, yeah, that's, good. that's an honour. Uh, let's call him. Um, let's call him Boris the Scarecrow. Boris the Scarecrow, okay, oh right? Mister Johnson won't like you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Boris. Well, he'd, he'd be good on a bike, Phil. Lean frame. <laughs> Definitely a hill climber. <laughs> it's sort of popular, but what the French did, you see, they didn't realise what they had. They needed more money. So in the early 80s, they started employing marketing people, changing their image as best they could. The French government finally realised what they had to sell because, like with all stage racing, all, all stage races around the world now, it's about selling your country to the public to get the tourism. Tourism's big business all over the world. Tour of Poland, Tour of Croatia, you name it, they're all showing you the countries as much as the race now. And so we all have to become experts in the countries. When I started talking about the castles and chateaux, I did it as a joke. Wow. Um, I, said, I used to say to Paul, I said, well, this is a nice one, Paul. It's in need of renovation. It's got no roof. And uh, um, who lived here? And he'd say, oh, Louis XIV back in the 14th century. Oh, really? Then the letters started coming in and say, this is fantastic. So then we had to really start work on these things because people were, we were, we were joking, but they, they weren't. Now the tour produces every year a special uh, book for the speakers uh, done in detail. They send a woman round the course who takes three weeks to cover every stage and write every monument up uh, that we get at the desk when we arrive at the tour. Yeah, and I mean, Phil, I mean, we, we look, we watch with the, the ease, but behind any great performance, in your case, commentary, there is a whole lot of preparation. I mean, um, that's all happening behind the scenes. I mean, you're not just sitting sitting around, rocking up and, and putting a mic in your hand, preparing for the riders, knowing their bios. I mean, uh, you, how do you record that data? Or do you have a system that you use? What's been your, uh, your go-to saviour there? Well, when uh, we go back to the early 80s, when I was on the Tour de Trump, as it was called then, became the Tour du Pont in, in Canada. And uh, as it's now the Tour de California, really. But this one was up in the northern part of the, of the states, in Vermont and New York State and up that way towards Albany. And uh, there was a guy that was supplying, uh, was getting all these Apple Mac computers uh, because he, he was buying them for, for the universities and stuff. And he said, hey, you've got to get one of these guys, because we became a really nice friend, Rob Strickland, his name was. And I said, Rob, I can't bloody work with computers. And he got to, he said. And he wrote me a program where I could um, I'd get put all my riders' names in, they automatically update their ages and all that. He wrote the program for me, and he gave it to me. And he said, try that. And I started the well, From that day on, uh, all my riders... Well, because in those days, there was no internet to go and have a look at riders' performance. You couldn't find any information on a rider. So you, it was gold dust. And I used to laugh when I used to get these occasional co-commentators, who were Americans usually, or they might have been Australian, depends where it was, saying, that's fantastic. Can I have a copy? I said, bugger off. Write your own. <laughs> Once you've given all your secrets away, I'm gone, have you? <laughs> and so uh, I, I did. That reminds me of Tommy Simpson when he, he went to, when he was world champion. He went on stage in the Isle of Man and the organiser said, tell him how you do it, Tom. He said, I'll tell him how I do it when I bloody retired. <laughs> Not with, and, uh, you know, that's the way we are, us northerners. He's northern as well. So, yeah, so that's what happened. Um, I started keeping records. And to this day, every day, the first hour of my day is reading everything about the cycling, putting it into my little computers. I mean, it, I can call up anything on the Tour de France on my own personal record books. Uh, and I built them as we go. And I had Greg Henderson ring me up the other day and I told him how many tours he'd ridden and where he finished. He was quite impressed. Phil, I mean, that's such a beautiful principle in life, isn't it? If you want to perform, there's there's homework you need to do. I had the great pleasure, Phil, talking from about one great Brit, uh, yourself to uh, another great Brit, of, uh, of doing yeah. some physiotherapy services for Roger Waters of Pink Floyd when he was on tour in Australia. And, yeah. and, and I, was, I was quite... I mean, uh, I was born in 1980, so it was a little bit ahead of my generation, but I was quite impressed with the fact that what I would find Roger doing every time I went to his hotel room, Phil, was sitting yeah. back, watching on his Apple Mac, there's the Apple again, uh, yeah. watching the show right through from start to finish as the start of the world really? tour and asking me, the humble physio, what do you think about this? I mean, behind every great performance, there's hours and hours of, of preparation, yeah. fine-tuning. And I love Pink Floyd, by the way. I'd, I'd love to have met Roger Water. Um, yeah, you can't let it drop. I think the day you let it drop, then you just retired. Yeah. You know, I don't want to get caught out. I mean, I don't know everybody, but 
especially yeah. I, I keep my eye on the juniors and the under 23s but my life's too busy I very rarely get to speak about them so I just I just look at the guys who are coming through we've got a few good ones just now after the world championship so I've, I've just made a mental note of the names and see how they make progress next year um, but nowadays I've got very good records on the women's cycling which are is now a fabulous sport in its own right. It was a dreary old, horrible sport uh, back in my day uh, because the girls just simply didn't race. But now they are terrific, absolutely terrific. Nothing but admiration for them. Yeah. And, I mean, it's up to you whether you think. I think cycling's probably a, it's a vicious sport and I don't like to see girls crash and stuff like that. But they chose to do it and they should be allowed to do it and that's fine by me. Yeah, here, here. Phil, uh, let's just jump forward to the more modern era and, and a few names I want to throw out. And Phil, uh, I want you to uh, pop one word next to these writers, okay? So I hope Phil Liggett's got his thinking hat on here. Here we go. You ready? So uh, Alberto Contador, one word to describe Alberto. One word to describe. I can think of plenty of words. Um, affable. Marco Pantani. Entertaining. Chris Frooms. Chris Froome, the quiet man. Uh, Robbie McEwen. The cocky man. <laughs> Jan Ulrich. Uh, deceptive. Sir Bradley Wiggins. An enigma. Miguel Indurain, obviously not the modern era, but... It, it, I don't mean it the way it sounds. We only want one word, so I'll call him boring. <laughs> Eddie Merckx. I mean, you've shared that already. Hero. Greg Lamond. Um, yeah, Greg, wow. Uh, one word to describe him, I don't know how it works. Greg is a fantastic guy, I haven't heard him. Ambitious. Richie Port. Richie Port. Um, hard to know about Richie. The Believer. And Phil Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans. Well, Trish is saying tough. Phil, there's another name. Obviously, we're going to come to that another name. But, but Phil, a couple of insights. Uh, most memorable tour stage of your 45 years on tour, starting, I believe, in 1973 through to the modern era, most memorable t- tour stage. Well, I always uh, quote the most memorable tour. It was 89, which is when Finjong lost on the last day. And it's that last stage, which was the time trial from Versailles into Paris which was, I have to say, and it sounds terribly um, uh, big-headed, it was our best commentary we ever did. Paul was fairly new. Paul started with me about 86, 87. I think his first tour with me was 87. Might have been 86. And it's only 89 now. And I advised him next day as we were traveling back to England, because he lived in England then, uh, he should resign and retire from the sport because you'll never commentate as well again. And it was because of that last day. We were on the outside the Palace of Versailles at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, recording the opening before we went live at two in the afternoon. And it was for British television. And I looked at the, uh, I said to Paul on camera, uh, well, who's going to win? And remember that uh, Le Mans was 55 seconds behind in, the, in just a 15 miles time trial, 24K time trial uh, left to go. And so Paul just said, well, it's got to be Fignon. Um, the guy lives in Paris. He's intelligent. He rides a great time trial. The French will bring him home. And I couldn't agree more. But I looked at the camera and said, well, I think Greg Lamond will win. And he'll win by six seconds. And uh, we stopped the tape. The tape was satellited to London and butted onto the front of our live show before we go to air. And, of course, then... Uh, Paul had worked out, because he likes his maths, Paul had worked out the average speeds and what Le Mans had to do over every kilometre. I think he had to gain 1.2 seconds or something like that. I can't remember now. And as we were calling the commentary, it, there was every sign that Le Mans was calling this 1.2 seconds and we were calling it. And then Fignon was, was the last rider to finish. Le Mans came down the Champs-Élysées, got his time. Now... Add on 55 seconds, or it would have to be 56 seconds, and um, we knew what uh, Fignon had to do. And then Fignon came down two minutes later behind him, and uh, we saw his time run out, about 150, 200 metres from the finish line. And when he hit the finishing line, up came his time, and I just said, I don't believe this, but Greg Lamond has won the Tour de France by eight seconds. And in London, where the, I was doing it all from... France live, but the producers were all in London. 
put the key over to me and this guy said, next time, Liggard, get it bloody right. <laughs> so I predicted eight and he'd won by six. And it was just a bigger key. I felt terribly sorry for Laurent Fignon and Laurent and I uh, came reasonable friends after he'd retired from the tour. And I interviewed Laurent in Cape Town some years later, 15 years later, maybe even more. And um, it was, probably was nearer 20 years later. And before we went on stage, he says, Phil, no questions about the Tour de France in 89. He says, if you ask one question, I will only speak in French. And he, he didn't want to know. It, it broke his heart. He never thought he could. Wow. That was not long before he passed, actually. Um, okay. A year or two, maybe. Uh, but yeah. I've been with Greg. Of course, Greg lives the moment. I interviewed Greg at a Legends dinner two years ago in New Zealand, in Auckland. And as part of the um, part of the trip, Greg agreed to go if they got him on a fishing boat. And they, they did. The Sky <laughs> Casino there put him on a boat and took us out fishing into the ocean. And we had an, a good couple of days. But at the night, Greg was... We talked about that tour. We dissected it because it was it did everything. That tour did everything. Le Monde would take yellow. So Fignon had come out and take it off him. So Greg would go back and get it back. Uh, three days out from the finish, they're coming into the finish. Uh, um, can't remember the town. It's somewhere in Provence, Aix-en-Provence. It was Aix-en-Provence. It doesn't matter. Uh, just before the finish is a roundabout off a nasty descent, the leaders came round. All of them fell off. All of them remounted. They were the top four riders in the overall classification. And they crossed the line in the exact order they would finish the Tour de France three days later. Uh, because oh, yeah. Greg won the stage, Fignon was second, La Jaretta, Delgado, La Jaretta, etc. Uncanny as hell. Wow. Oh, yeah. uh, it was just a tour to be loved. And so that's my favourite tour. And Phil, so 89 goes down as your favourite. Phil, three things. The gutsiest win, the most unlucky cyclist, and the toughest stage. So let's start with the gutsiest win. Well, the gutsiest win, um, I think we've got to look at uh, Cadell um, because he'd lost the tour on the road to Alpe d'Huez and he had to ride on his own to chase down uh, Andy Schleck. Uh, the guys were with him, but they, were, they knew what he had to do, so they let him do all the pedalling. And he saved the day and he went on in the time trial to just wipe out Andy Schleck. The viewing figures were astronomical back home in Australia. And when he came into into Federation Square, 80,000 people, he couldn't believe that anybody even knew his name. Because no matter how um, famous he became, he still believes nobody knows him. You know, that's the way uh, that's the way Cadell is. And, um, and now he knew everybody was watching the Tour de France. SBS figures went through the ceiling. They'd never seen figures like that for television. It was absolutely stunning. So that was a great tour. And it somehow... We just knew Cadell could pull it off. But that day, he, he was over two minutes behind and he somehow clawed it back into reality. Yeah, just beautiful. And, and what about the most unlucky rider? Well, I guess many would say Fignon in 89 after the way he lost the tour. Nobody could concede 55 seconds. It was all because they used the the tri bars, um, which were invented by Boone Lennon for, uh, for Greg and they were one-piece bars, and the organisers decreed they were okay. But, of course, Fignon had clip-ons. They weren't allowed. So I suppose you're pretty unlucky there. But uh, uh, there's been many unlucky cyclists in the world of cycling. Well, my own, our own Tom Simpson, because he died on the Von too, because he never knew his own strength. And he, he believed he could win the Tour de France, and, and he couldn't. That was... Uh, I don't know. There's there's a lot of bad luck in the world of cycling. Roger Rivier when he crashed in the in the sixties down the ravine, he was a brilliant, likely stage winner, he, uh, tour winner, and he never rode a bike again. The tour has seen some nasty accidents over the years. Belocchi. Trish was mentioning uh, Yoshiba Belocchi. Yep. He crashed going down with Lance Armstrong into Gap, um, and then Gap rode across. He came back, but he didn't ride at the same level again. And Phil, what about the toughest stage? Last sort of question in, in, in sort of highlights there. What would the toughest stage be you've ever ever witnessed outside of the 89 tour? Well, you know, it's very difficult for me. I, I commentate on them, but I never witness them anymore. I used to ride, drive on the tour in the early days, but the tour became so busy and television, we had to be at the finish at least three hours before. Now we're there a day before. 
Um, so we don't actually see the roads. The, the, somebody following the tour, they're going to witness heroics beyond belief that never get reported. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I remember uh, Claudio Chiapucci. He did what I called at the time a ride of the quality of Fausto Coppi when he crossed the mountain chain on his own to Sestria in the Alps. And in, they were the Italian Alps, and he finished so far ahead. Um, that was an heroic ride of the quality of the men of the, the great men of the past. Uh, those, the, the way the technology is taken over the tour now, the shortening of the stages, I think the big long heroics have been taken out of the tour by purely by definition, really. And I find that sad because I'm a traditionalist, but understand them, I understand why. But I, uh, people like Kia Pucci were good. And Le Monde, when he was leading, uh, when Le Monde went on to win the tour on his comeback in 89, Kia Pucci was leading the tour. And Greg Le Monde always called him Cappuccino. And he used to say, well, I don't understand this Cappuccino. I'll, I'll wipe him out sooner or later. And eventually chased him down off the Tourmalet and up to Luzardi Den. He caught him and finally got the, the race lead off him. Yeah, well, Phil, what would you say are the top three characteristics of a great cyclist as opposed to a good cyclist? What are the top three characteristics performance-wise? Well, you've got to have – these days they look at numbers. Again, it's another one of my pet hates. And uh, I think it's Contador's recently said they shouldn't have these wattage machines on their bikes because numbers, for me, make them robots. Uh, and at the end of the day – as Paul Sherwin used to tell bike riders after he'd finished the tour and he was talking to them, he said, listen, what you've got to remember is uh, you've got to just fucking suffer, mate. Uh, <laughs> that's all it is. Don't give a shit because Chris Borben used to say, oh, I wasn't getting the numbers today. And Paul saying, bugger the numbers, just bloody suffer. Because <laughs> Chris Borben was a brilliant bike rider. He won the prologue at least twice. But putting, as soon as the first mountain came, he was first man to be dropped. But he wasn't that bad. He couldn't be that bad of 190 cyclists when you when he's such a talented boy, world hour record holder, world champion pursuit, etc. And so Paul says there are times you know you got to throw that thing away and just just be yourself and hurt yourself. So you know the, the, I think the first attribute of a great champion is you've got to have the talent. Um, talent, something you can't feel. It, it just happens. But if you, you mentally believe in yourself, then that's what matters. If you believe truly that you can do it, then you're going you're gonna to go down fighting whatever happens. Yes, you've got to have the big lungs. I think that's the most important part. A strong heart, big lungs. There's no body shape for cyclists. I've seen tall, thin ones win stages. I've seen short, fat ones win stages. Merckx isn't a particularly outstanding character to look at. Yes, he's a big man, he's well built, but he's not, uh, he doesn't look like an athlete when, uh, these days, and the great athlete that he was. And neither does Greg LeMond. Um, usually the guys, I always tend to think they've all got big hands. Don't ask me why. I always think cyclists have big hands that, that succeed. <laughs> uh, do a lot of work with the hands pulling on those handlebars. Uh, absolutely. The muscle definition can be none at all, like Gerard Saint, a guy that got killed. Uh, off, outside of cycling on a, one occasion, he had legs like matchsticks, and yet he could fly up mountains. And he never, he never realised how good he was because he got killed in a car crash, if memory serves me right. And um, there's no body shape, but I think the most important thing the Belgians had that famous phrase. I've never heard it for years, but the phrase at the time I used to race was, "The man who suffers ten minutes longer than the next one wins the race." Ten minutes of pain is an awful long time. Yeah. If you can apply yourself. And, and people, when they watch television, they don't realize the pain these guys are actually going through. They think, oh, they can do it. Yeah, they can do it. But they're hurting just like the guy who just got dropped. Um, yeah, they have a little bit of talent, but they're hurting just the same. Same pain, same of application. I mean, I can hurt myself when I ride a bike, and that's probably the only reason... I did better because I didn't have the super talent of an Eddie Merck, so you had to hurt yourself. So talent, enduring hurt. What would be the third characteristic, Phil, of great cyclists? Ambition and desire to win. Uh, it's pretty much the same, I suppose. But you, you've, got to, you've got to believe in yourself. Your bike riding will have given you some results, but if you don't believe in yourself when the chips are down, 
and sometimes bad. I used to watch the junior cyclists come through, always winning bike races, one after another. And the minute they turned amateur, never mind pro, they couldn't win because they couldn't understand why there was others almost as good as they were. And they just couldn't win. I've got a whole list of riders I used to watch. And Phil, on the ambition stakes, there's probably no name more synonymous with you know, rage in ambition than obviously the one name that I alluded, uh, sorry, I excluded off the uh, the one word names that we had a little bit of fun with yeah. just a moment ago. Yeah. And that's obviously Armstrong. I mean, let's start there. What's one word you'd use to describe Lance? Well, I called him, I called him Brash when he came on stage uh, to receive an award. Uh, I was doing some, some awards in, in Vail in Colorado and he just finished his treatment and he was bald. And uh, I welcome him on board as the brash, brash cyclist who's, at the time, of course, there was, everybody was full of admiration totally because he'd been a world champion. He'd been a world champion and he'd, he'd, he'd now got the problem with his, with his testicle cancer. And then he suddenly, because he told me, he used to ask the doctor if he could go for a ride while well, he was in full treatment. The doctor said, if you can ride your bike, ride it. And he could ride five miles, he used to sit in the ditch, cry, get back on his bike and ride back five miles. And that's the sort of, so, you know, once he became, once he came out of treatment, he changed his whole body shape. He'd, he'd taken EPO as a matter of fact when he was under treatment because that was a normal treatment to keep the blood, the blood thin and stuff and make more red cells. But then he took the decision when he finally got to the tour with a whole different mental attitude to life as well now. And his words to his team were, were, if we're going to win the Tour de France, we've got to do what they do, and we've got to do it better to get the job done. That's a very typical American outlook on life, and that's what he did. We now know. This whole conversation, we have a lot of time, will be about the details. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Yes or no, was one of those banned substances EPO? Yes. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusions to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever use any other banned substances like testosterone, uh, cortisone, or human growth hormone? Yes. Yes or no? In all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. I mean, I was uh, actually at the World 2012 uh, Triathlon Championships in Auckland racing in my age category. And uh, uncannily enough, right. this was only a matter of days before, I guess, it made mainstream news at the beginning of the fall from Grace. And I was reading uh, Tyler Hamilton's book and I was just in shock and I was sharing it with a few of my Australian teammates. I'm like, can you believe this if this is true? And then it all sort of broke. What was going through your head, Phil, uh, when, when you sat watching as the world did the obviously the famous Oprah interview and uh, and Oprah asked that first opening question, did you use banned substances to enhance your performance? Yes or no? And, and Lance's categorical answer was yes. What was going through Phil Liggett, the voice of Cycling's head? Well, I'd arrived in uh, for the start of the tour down under and I came from the airport and when I arrived at the hotel because it was all going to happen the next day, there was a block of cameras out there. I thought bloody Mick Jagger must have been in the car behind because it was incredible. And the driver said, I can take you around the back if you like. I said, why are they for me? He said, they all think they are. And they all, because of what was about to happen, they all wanted the story. And I couldn't even get out of the car. They were cramming me. Anyway, I gave them the story. And then that, 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 it was that afternoon. That afternoon, we got, the, we got the, uh, the open show. And the manager of the hotel gave me a private room because the press were all waiting to film me sat in the in the main room where the, everybody else was. So I watched it in the private room up in the hotel. And then uh, I just remember the first questions as clear as it was yesterday, as you probably do. Yes, 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 yes. And I thought, fuck, you know. You know, because I'm a great believer in you've got to prove there's only one way you could have got Lance, as we know. It was a confession because... Uh, He'd, he'd found the secrets, and that's for sure. It wasn't a land, it wasn't a guy I particularly liked. He's, he was brash. He was ruthless. You call him what they like. He was he, nobody liked him, and this is the one reason that the uh, drugs agencies wanted to nail him to the cross, because uh, whenever they said something about him, he sued him and he won. 
uh, newspapers alike. So he'd made himself a hateful person in the whole world and nobody could catch him. So the only reason he confessed were, uh, was because his son was being bullied at school. And in the end, Lance told him not to stick up for him because he was guilty. And his mum his mum couldn't face anybody. The, the live stream, live strong people, they were devastated. They were, they were the three big hurts in Lance's life. And he told all of them before he came to the opera show to what he was going to say. I was shocked. But I, I mean, he was so far ahead of everybody else. Don't get me wrong, that guy was an immense talent. You can't make a donkey into a thoroughbred with a couple of files of EPO. I could take a gallon of the stuff and I would never keep up with Lance Armstrong. It was impossible. So but if you're good, then you're 10% better than anybody else. And, and, and Phil, I mean, over the years that have, that have ensued, uh, you know, Lance has uh, you know, got his own podcast, commentates some, you know, some yeah. stages between the two. Have you had a conversation with Lance in recent years, Phil? The last time I saw Lance was in Toronto, the 9th of September 2011, we have never seen or spoken or corresponded since. He's never bothered to come back to me and take it whichever way you like. Nowadays, I just don't know what I'd say to him. I don't hate him. I don't dislike him. He played the game he thought was the way to play it. He was never a person I could endear to because he wasn't the sort of person you would endear to. Uh, even his team, I'm not sure his team that knew him very well. There was nobody in his life, really, um, except his immediate partner. Yeah, and you mentioned his son. I believe his name's Luke there, Phil. And uh, I recall the the one moment I felt like, <clears throat> you know, Oprah was interviewing a a human being mm. with empathy and with a with a soul was when she did ask about his boy. And um, and that was the one moment I saw his eyes, you know, glaze yeah. over with a with a tear. And you know, I actually just felt great pity for him. I, I thought, ah, oh, you know, I remember reading Tyler Hamilton's book and thinking, you know what. If I was in that situation as a young, you know, ambitious 19-year-old, would would the world have looked any different, you know? And, and I just felt such a sadness for the, the sport at that stage and, and, and for Lance. Definitely the sport was suffering badly because, uh, especially in the English-speaking world, because they're not interested in the sport. It, the English-speaking world doesn't understand the sport. All they want to do is talk about the bad side of it. Yes. They weren't interested in the fact that, yes, AFL players take drugs and football players and golf players and Formula One drivers. We don't care. Uh, but cycling, you just, I mean, it's too easy to call it drug peddling, isn't it? And so uh, that's the way it is. And even now, I had a phone call only just after the tour of Spain uh, from a radio station in Britain to assess the, um, the achievement of Chris Froome this year. He's British, although they don't count him as British because he's never here. But <laughs> I, I just had to explain to them right from day one, just if it had been somebody like David Beckham or the English football team, then you'd understand. But what he achieved was immense and has never been done before either uh, because the tour has never been held in April, in September time uh, and, and the Tour de France and Tour of Spain. So... I don't know. I, I saw the great side of Lance. I did all of the uh, gigs. He asked me to do them. I thought he was joking. I didn't think he even knew who I was. <laughs> and he asked me in Amiens at the, during the state of the Tour de France, he said, you come into Canada this year with me. I said, why would I do that? He said, because I need somebody I can trust on the mic. This guy's no good. So I don't know who that guy was. And I said, well, yeah. And so I went. I, I got paid. Cause he didn't pay me. The organizers did. Um, but I met all these cancer sufferers. I met his physicians and his surgeons, uh, lovely people. And, uh, and I steered Lance through all of the gigs and the bike rides. We did the rides together and we raised millions of dollars. And it was all just fantastic stuff. I had people come up who were on the last stages of type 4 cancer, wouldn't be around next week. And all they wanted to do was meet Lance Armstrong and shake his hand. He raised $600 million uh, in his time with Livestrong. Livestrong has now become virtually extinct. It's still going, but we never hear about it. Wow. Um, and he feels bad about that. But his attitude is very American. Let's get the job done. If that's what they want, we'll play it better than they can. And that was his attitude. But his, his, the reason he got hammered is because he ridiculed the world. All the drugs agencies, all the journalists... And he went for the throat and he sued him. And all they wanted was to get him. I mean, they just put the, the, the drugs agencies pussyfooted over the heads of all of his teammates 
threatened them. With, they had to make confessions because of the high court situation, grand jury. Um, that they, they, they were in an invidious position, but they got let off. A couple of couple of months suspension, and, and most had retired anyway. They only wanted Lance, and that's the way life is. I'm afraid, you, you, as they say, you make your bed and you lie in it. So, listeners, a quick break from Phil before we pop right back. Today's show, as always, is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you perform at your physical best, and we do this through our industry-first, fixed feet and unlimited access, two, six, and 12-week finish line programs. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to experience the high-five moment of having crossed their physio finish line. That's where we high-five you, we tell you that we love you, but you've finished your rehabilitation and you're back to your physical best. Listeners, for more information about Pogo Physio's finish line programs or our one-hour Discover Recover initial appointments or even our wellness boosters, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. If you've missed previous episodes of the Physical Performance Show, including last week's episode featuring another great British uh, figure, Ben Morrow, dual Commonwealth Games marathon runner, then jump back and be sure to tune in and listen about Ben, share all things around his 2016 Rio Olympic campaign that didn't go to plan, the disappointment around that, balancing working and running at an elite level, and also some very practical and great running training tips. Here's a little snippet if you missed it. Actually, when I think back to 2012 as well, it's quite interesting. 2012 was the year I moved to Australia, but I gave up work um, in January uh, to focus for three or four months just on trying to qualify for the Olympics. If I'm honest, and I trained the house down, it's possible that I overtrained a little bit. I went to Kenya for uh, three weeks. I went to Portugal to just train for a month. All right, let's jump back in with Phil Liggett. Phil, uh, back on you for a moment. You've said you're a commentator for the people. What do you mean by that? No, the commentators currently are cycling enthusiasts, and frankly, everyone I listen to bores me to death, uh, and that's a shame. And um, so I've I've just decided that well, when I started, I and I was asked to do many new sports as well, winter sports. I've done all the Winter Olympics and ski jumping and alpine skiing. I had to learn those sports. And I found that the people who are watching television want to be entertained and be able to get up and turn that telly off saying, that was a bloody good program, that. <laughs> Whereas the, today the cyclists talk a load of bloody pulse beats and, uh, you know, what happened yesterday morning when he went to the toilet. And and it doesn't, it doesn't keep any viewers. I'm not interested. And don't get me wrong. I love the cyclists. But... When I get a viewership of, say, 2.5 million viewers, there can't be 200,000 real cyclists watching. So I'm more interested in the 2.3 million viewers I've left behind to make sure they continue. And I was, uh, I was, at, I was in the market in my a village town about 20k away, called St Albans City. Went to the market yesterday morning. And I, this guy had shorts on, uh, bloody freezing. He was the market man selling the veg. And he looked as though he shaved his legs. I couldn't see much hair on him, nice brown legs. I said, no, you're a brave man on a day like today. Do you shave your legs? Are you a cyclist? <laughs> he says, no. And then he looked up. He said, but I know your voice. He says, you started me watching television in 1987 when Stephen Roach won. I said, yeah, it's 30 years this year. Good heavens, what a pleasure to meet you. He had no interest in cycling. Now, they're the people I love to meet because they're the people we want. And that's why the sport has grown. Nowadays, everybody riding a bike for health and relaxation. Our lanes here are covered in cyclists. But they're not cyclists like I call them. I call them new world cyclists. Half I could stop every one in nine out of every ten and tell them how to really enjoy the bike with the right position, you know. But, um, no, I, I think it's very important. And for that reason now, I had a letter. Because this year, the Tour de France changed the rules, so they can't get access my voice now. And so they're using uh, Aussie commentators, but they don't work for SBS. They work for the tour, Matthew and Robbie, yes. who are the best of friends. They're the best of friends. But I had this letter from this woman in Warburton in Victoria in total tears saying, I don't know what I'm going to do because who's going to tell me about the birds? Who's going to tell me about the chateau and 
because she's the, the most unlikely person who's going to want to know that this guy is uh, is just about to peak at 415 watts. And she wouldn't have a clue what it meant. So I don't know. I did it my way, as they say, and uh, and I enjoy the the people who stopped me all over the world. There's no other cycling commentator, or indeed no commentator I know of, who is mobbed and stopped in almost every country I walk in. And that I feel, I feel as though I've hit the spot I was aiming at. Wow! And uh, and Phil, that young boy who uh, you know Trish encountered having broken his collarbone, hit by an elephant uh, while riding his bike. <laughs> um, who could have ever imagined a career like this? Yeah, I know. I didn't, and I still, I still live. I mean, I remember oh, ten years into doing cycling and stuff, and I said to my wife, I said, "You know, BBC just paid me twenty pounds for ten seconds on on television. I can't believe that anybody's paying me money to talk about cycling." Because in those days, nobody talked about cycling. That's probably why I got all the jobs. Phil, uh, let's just briefly touch on the Olympics, and then I'll, I'll come through a few final questions here. The Olympic Games, you've been to 15, covered 15. Yeah. Just amazing. This is a bit like choosing favourite birds or children. But what's your favourite Olympic moment, Phil, uh, across the, the games that you've called? I enjoyed particularly a ski jumping competition. It, it would have been 92. It, would, it probably would have been 94 or 98. I can't tell you which. Okay. But Miller Hammer. Because I was doing the ski jumping, and these Japanese jumpers, it was the team event, and the this guy had to jump out of his skin to get them into the medals. It was a big thing for Japan. Again, I, I, I never told anybody I was an expert in ski jumping. I've got a co-commentator to tell them. and boy, But I, uh, I, did, I did tell them uh, about the personality of this guy and what you what have to do and... And God, this guy put in the jump of the, I thought he was going to land outside the run out. And in amongst the crowd, he jumped off the 120. I can't remember his damn name. But hell, he put them and he got them a bronze medal. And uh, it was a sensational story. And they did it in such spectacular style. And that's brought everybody around the world to the edge of the seats to enjoy. Uh, and they're those, those things stick in your mind. And uh, I mean, for, for all the Winter Olympics, uh, the Aussies have been always good to me, uh, and the summer too, because the, I, my last, well, my last for a British network was the BBC in Los Angeles in '84, because the BBC used to ask six months to go. And I couldn't waste, I couldn't live in the hope of being asked to do an Olympics six months away. The Aussies used to contact me, call for a meeting in London, 18 months before. Yeah, and I'd rather have the contract signed knowing where I'm working than in the hope the BBC might decide to take me six months out. So I started working with all the Aussie networks, Channel Nine, Channel um, Ten, Channel Seven, and, and SBS contacted me when I came to the Commonwealth Bank Classic. We stayed friends ever since. They expect total professionalism, but they do it in a nice way. And you know, when you're not working, you're all a great team of friendly people. Uh, and this year I was, uh, sorry, last year in, in uh, the Rio Olympics, I went down, the only time I got away from the area where I was working, went down to uh, Copacabana to a function. But while I was going to the function, I the car dropped me outside the function, but on the beach. And there's the usual things going on. It's the netball, what do they call it? The netball team, um, beach volleyball. There was kids playing football. And this uh, producer and his uh, interviewer came up and uh, they were part of the team because we only give in interviews to Channel 7, but I didn't know them because they were a news team. And they just said, hey, Phil, we understand that you can commentate on just about anything. I said, uh, oh, maybe. <laughs> said, okay, then just commentate what you can see around here. And I, I looked at the girls who got virtually no clothes on playing volleyball. <laughs> I mean, virtually no clothes on. And the kids playing football. I commentated on the kids playing football. Uh, and the kids scored and did all the tricks, you know. I said a few nice things about that. Then I got turned to the women and the girls. And I said, the only trouble is I find it very difficult to commentate on, on the players when there's nowhere to pin the number. <laughs> and we went on in this vein, and this girl came up, and she shimmied full frontal to the camera. Oh, God, we'll be locked up here because she had nothing on virtually. Anyway, they had to pass it through the lawyers, 
and they said play it and it went out at um, peak viewing time and, and it, was, it was a great show wow well that's that's one of the unexpected phil liggett uh <laughs> phil a few fun questions to uh to to, to come home on and and that would be phil liggett if you could have three people at your dinner table living or past mm. uh who would be at phil liggett's table and why God, well, straight off the top, without a shadow of a doubt, um, Sir David Attenborough. He's do- he's done so much uh, to save the world, and he shouldn't be allowed to die. Hmm. And his, his stories would be knocked out, of course they would. If you're looking into the sport of cycling, well, Eddie is a very, very difficult man to talk to, Eddie, because he's not a talking person. But I did interview him in the Legends Dinner in the Tour Down Under a few years ago, and he was brilliant. I got a standing ovation, and I went to his table afterwards. I said, Eddie, you were brilliant. And he looked at me and he said, no, Phil, you were brilliant. <laughs> what it was, I dragged out of him what he'd love to say, but he never can say it. And and it was a great night. So I'd like Eddie along because he's, you know, he's a great guy. Difficult to know. I'd like a pop star of some, some description. I mean, Mick Jagger wrote the foreword to a book I wrote many years ago because Mick was a, used to get him his bikes in the old days, in the 60s from my local bike shop. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, Mick's a very intelligent guy. He's my age exactly, and um, he doesn't drink. That's that's his downfall. But he probably takes things. I wouldn't know. <laughs> there, there are so many people I've met. I mean, some of Lance's girlfriends, Kate Hudson and, uh, and Cheryl Crow, nicest people you'll ever meet. And they're superstars. Nicest people. I went to, I saw Cheryl when we were having dinner with Lance at his house in the Cape, Cape Verde in uh, by Nice, and he was going out with them. And I'd never met Cheryl. I went up and said, hi, Cheryl. I said, I'm Phil. I know who you are, she said. And so she, she knew everything. She loved cycling, and she could pick a guitar, she could sing. She was talented. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and Phil, if you could boil everything you've observed, you've experienced as a cyclist yourself, down to one solitary piece of advice to help listeners perform at their best, what would that one piece of advice be, Phil Liggett? Um, believe in yourself and suffer like hell. <laughs> believe in yourself and suffer like hell. Brilliant. Phil, uh, we like to have the guests of this program issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week. It can be entry level or extremely difficult. What's Phil Liggett's one piece of advice going to be? Well, they better do what Chris does every day, and that's get on the turbo rollers for one hour when you get up and feel as though you've achieved something, which I don't do. <laughs> um, personally, the only way I keep uh, strong, and at my age, and I don't feel my age, which is 74, um, the only reason I keep strong is because I ride my bike. And I think the day I stop riding my bike with all my lack of other exercise, I'll probably die within a year. So the is you get up and you do something. Just move. Do something physical. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, you're still riding, Phil. Uh, it's well known. And uh, yeah, I ride about 150 k a week on a good week. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and such an ambassador for the sport, Phil. Uh, I'd like you to tag a guest. Who do you think listeners should hear from in terms of the physical performance show? Who's Phil Liggett going to tag for this program? In a physical performance show. Well, I'd love. I'd love to uh, to hear from Eddie Merckx. The trouble is Eddie can't tell you how to do anything because he doesn't know how he did it in the first place. <laughs> Somebody like Greg Lamond would never stop talking, so you'd never ask another question after question one because he just <laughs> never stops talking. But he's very interesting, don't get me wrong. Well, well Phil, I'm going to need your help to organise one of those gentlemen, so uh, we'll connect after, after the, uh, yeah. the episode today. But Phil Liggett, uh, one final question, and that is you were uh, awarded with the MBE in 2005 from the Queen herself. And uh, yeah. I'm curious, finally, mm. what did the Queen say to you as she awarded you with the, uh, the Order of the British Empire? Well, first of all, it was the greatest uh, moment of my life, I reckon, to, to get an MBE because uh, I'm a great royalist. And, uh, and I, when I got the letter, it came from the, the Prime Minister uh, from Downing Street. A very poor letterhead. It's only embossed. You can't even see it. And I thought somebody was taking the piss. Because it just says, uh, if the Queen was so disposed to give you a medal, an honour, uh, would you accept it? And the reason they say that is because the Beatles sent theirs back, back in the 60s. And so they've never made the same mistake again. So if you don't say, accept it, that's the last you hear. If you accept it, they warn you that this is only an inquiry and there's no guarantee you're getting anything. So don't tell anybody. 
Anyway, I did. I got the MB. So I went to the palace, and the guy, the equerry who comes in and talks to you, says, uh, right, everybody, well, you're all extremely lucky today because Her Majesty herself will be uh, investing you. And um, and he tells us how to go through the routine. And it was a very funny way he told us. I loved every minute of it. So then you go into the grand ballroom one by one when your name is called. You you bow or curtsy and you step up to Her Majesty. She gives you a hand, shakes it. And as the guy said, she will ask you a question. And he says, do not give your life story by way of a reply because it, there's a lot of people behind you. And um, so the Queen just said to me, she just leaned down. She said, this cycling is getting very popular now, isn't it? And I said, yes, ma'am, it is. Thank you. Next. And that's all she said. Wow. But when I get behind the curtain after leaving her, because you go out a different way, they give you a box for your medal. And the, the staff is there boxing the medals for you. And these guys and girls come to me and said, hey, we all watch you, you know, in the palace. I said, what? Everybody watches on the Tour de France. How do you get that job? And all of a sudden, I had a full conversation around the back with all the staff. They all were enthusiasts, and not one was a cyclist. And that is what I like to hear. And what a way to finish. Therein lies the legacy of Phil Liggett. Uh, yeah. Phil Liggett, you have been an absolute gentleman and uh, such an honour from my end as a cycling triathlon fan to, to catch up with you. And uh, big thanks also to your lovely wife, Trish, who is uh, out there tendering to that scarecrow, Boris. <laughs> You decided to sit out there yourself. Now, much better scarecrow than what you knew. <laughs> Phil Liggett, you're a gentleman, and we wish you all the best for the uh, the future years of cycling, commentating, and bird watching, and uh, and game hunting. That oh, but we'll fight on, and um, and come and see me man, when you get to the Gold Coast again. Oh, I'd love to, Phil Liggett. And I, I said game hunting there. I meant fighting the game hunting. So uh, my correction. Next week uh, we fly over to Africa, and a week on Sunday, uh, David Zaharakis, who plays for the Essendon Bombers is coming to stay with us for 10 days. He's never been to Africa, and I'm about to take him and show him some rhinos and elephants in the wild. Wow. He, called, he wrote to me just this morning. He's booked his flight. And what's your connection with David? Well, I was, uh, I was giving a talk in the Australian Embassy in London. They've sort of adopted me because of all my work in Australia. And they said, we've sat you next door. It was an AFL London-based uh, special luncheon. And because there is a European AFL run by the Aussies. Oh, wow. And so David oh. was in town and uh, he plays. He's, he's one that got away. He never uses, he hates the sight of needles. So he was never remotely involved in the scandal that hit the bombers. Uh, and now, of course, they've had a great season and he was leading the way. So he's very happy bunny at the moment. But he, um, he started talking to me about the rhinos. And I told him we have a, the village next to where I'm living is called Essendon. I said, in our village pub in Essendon, we fly the Essendon Bombers flag, and he didn't believe me. I said, come up tomorrow night, and I'll show you, and he did. Took him in the pub. The pub gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> Within an hour, he's pulling the pints behind the bar, and he was over the moon. We got pretty good friends after that. He's a nice guy. He's only 30 or something like that. Yeah. And, um, so he took me up on the offer to come to Africa, and he'll be there a week on Sunday. Beautiful, mate. Have a great afternoon. Lovely, mate. All the best. Uh, listeners, how about that? Phil Liggett, the voice of cycling. I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I clearly did in bringing it to you. Listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, please let myself and Phil know. Tag us in on social media. I'm at Brad underscore beer, and you can find all of Phil Liggett's handles quite easily to search for him on any social media platform or simply jump over to pogophysio.com.au for the show notes where we'll have all links to all handles. Be sure also to check out Phil's much-loved charity, Helping Rhinos, over at helpingrhinos.org. And please enter the competition. We will be giving away from Pogo Physio one of the terrific cycling jerseys for the Helping Rhinos organization. They look absolutely terrific. And all you need to do is repost the Phil Liggett episode from Pogo Physio over on Instagram and be inside the top 100 to do this. 
and we will randomly select someone to win one of these great cycling jerseys. So be sure to check that out. Listeners, if you'd like to receive the Physic Performance Show inside your app or podcast player each and every week, be sure to hit subscribe from within your app. If you've been enjoying the program, then please leave a review over on iTunes. Reviews help people who, just like yourself, are looking to perform at their physical best get the Physic Performance Show in their ears. If you enjoyed today's episode, then consider sharing it. Obviously, there's a competition on social media, but share it with someone, a cycling fan, someone that just loves the Tour de France. That would mean a lot. Listeners, coming up next week on the Physical Performance Show, I caught up with an AFL great, Spider Everett. For overseas listeners, that's Australian Football League. Spider is an absolute figure, an absolute figure of the AFL world here in Australia. His career spanned a remarkable 16 years and just under 300 games. He was one of the most prolific goal scorers in AFL history, and he also revolutionised, I should say, the role of Ruckman in the mid to late 90s. Spider and I talk through his career, the highs, the lows, the learnings. We also touch on the Gold Coast Airport Marathon where I had the the fun and the pleasure of accompanying Spider as he made his marathon debut here on the Gold Coast. So tune in next week. That'll be episode 85 of the Physical Performance Show featuring Spider Everett. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.